Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us for The Late Show. I do have my dear wife with me to help me and support me. Uh, we are going to have an interesting evening, hopefully, only if you take part, because the thing is that I have so many notes, I can't just be reading them left, right and centre. So that what we want to know is, you know, is Mount Sinai somewhere in the Sinai Peninsula, because there is where St. Catherine's uh, Monastery is, and the other one uh, is in Saudi Arabia, known today as Saudi Arabia, but in the old days, was it just known as Arabia? And the thing is that there's so many other places and people's opinions, etc., uh, as to why it is this place or that place. And I wanted to just get your help today because I know that you're very much into the Bible, all of you, right? Yes, of course you are. That you'll know what to do. Um, and when I ask you, and Leslie will ask you, to send in your emails live at revelationtv.com. I'm looking forward to reading your emails and uh, be great if you have different points of view. It always makes it more interesting. So do get involved in the program and uh, give us your thoughts and opinions. Yes, but let's start with a video that I put together just a couple of hours ago, uh, which is all about the Exodus. It's a very short uh, clip and I just want you to uh, take notice of some of the things and some of the places and observe carefully as we go through the reasons why we think maybe this is one place in Saudi Arabia, or maybe it's another place in the Sinai Peninsula. Have a look at this. God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before pi Haharoth, between Migdal and the sea, here there was enough space for the children of Israel to gather in order to cross the Red Sea. En route to this beach, Moses led the children of Israel through many winding and wandering pathways. In Exodus uh, chapter 14 verse 3, it says they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Josephus, the first century historian, wrote, they drove them into a narrow place. The Lord God of Israel led his people to the Red Sea, knowing that Pharaoh and his armies were thinking that they had hemmed in the children of Israel so they could slaughter them all. This account was reinforced again by Josephus, the historian. They were encompassed with mountains, the sea, and their enemies. With nowhere to escape, they were between the devil and the deep blue sea. However, right here is an area that was much shallower than the main part of the Red Sea. But nothing would be hard for God Almighty. As the scripture in Isaiah chapter 51 verse 10 says, Are you not the one that made the depths of the sea a road? And here across the waters, in what is now called Saudi Arabia, is a huge area which could easily cope with 600,000 men of Israel, let alone the children and the women. However, there is much more that I would like to share with you regarding the Exodus, so please stay tuned. Thank you. Yes, there's much to discuss and we'll go through uh, my notes as best as we can. Uh, but really, as I say, we need you to actually say, OK, uh, this, I think this and the reasons why, because there are some uh, really good points for, for all the arguments for where Mount Sinai is. But it's also it means that the route in which they took uh, to get to uh, the promised land at the end of the day is also questionable because of certain points which we'll bring out uh, a little by little, as it were. But uh, meanwhile, where is Mount Sinai? Is it in the Sinai Peninsula or Saudi Arabia? That's what I really want to be talking about. Um, well, looking at the, my notes here, it says, where is the real Mount Sinai? No one really knows for sure. For centuries, <laughs> don't laugh, Leslie. For centuries, scholars, explorers, and pilgrims have sought the location of the real Mount Sinai, the mountain where God gave the law to Moses uh, and the people of Israel. To this day, several sites have been proposed, but no one site has been confirmed by archaeology as the place where God met with Moses. 
The Bible gives uh, some general clues about the location of Mount Sinai. Uh, we know it was outside of Egypt for sure, because the Israelites came to Mount Sinai after leaving Egypt. The traditional site of Mount Sinai is in the south central part of the Sinai Peninsula, uh, which is the mountain today called Jebel Musa, the mountain of Moses. Has an elevation of uh, 7,497 feet, um, and that's above sea level. And in AD 530, St. Catherine's Monastery uh, was constructed at the northern foot of Mount Sinai. Other locations proposed for Mount Sinai include sites in the western, central and northern parts of Sinai. Uh, one theory identifies Mount Sinai as the modern uh, Mount Yerom in the northern Negev desert. Others see Sinai as being in the southern Edom. Another view is that it places Mount Sinai in the northwestern Saudi Arabia, associating it with uh, the mountain called Jabal Magla, or Jabal El Lors. Now Paul gets into this as well. I, this is uh, something that might be new to you, but in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25, Paul mentions Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, this will be up for discussion. Where was he talking about when he's saying Mount Sinai, Arabia? We'll look at that in a minute in more depth. It's good to keep in mind that Arabia is in the ancient world. It's not to be equated with the Saudi Arabia. In the modern world, this is what some are saying. The biblical term Arabia covers a vast area, including what we now call Saudi Arabia. So where is the real Mount Sinai? No one say for sure. Scholars differ widely on the proposed sites that I've mentioned. And what happened at Mount Sinai though? changed the whole world. So, let's hear from you uh, and your points, but I'll just read some of the notes here, Leslie. Let me just tell you that we've got um, a text here. Um, Hi, Howard and Leslie, I love the history. Thank you so much. Well, it's good, good to go into the history. To be honest, it's never, it's not really my forte it's not mine either. and i did say to you earlier <laughs> i don't really mind, i don't mind where it is yes. i did say that yes. it, it, does, it, it doesn't actually it's not here yeah but I was, sure. it, it, it doesn't actually matter to me but people who really study the bible bible scholars will have very um strong opinions on where it is and it, and it is important when you actually want to tr um, follow the route. Yes, well the reason is that uh, we've got Andrew Jones which has uh, become a friend of ours in the sense that he's doing a lot of excavations or discoveries I should yes. call it uh, in Saudi Arabia and also where the ark is in northern Turkey. So uh, he's going to spending you know lots of money um, to try and find out these sites and it's very interesting that Saudi Arabia has kept a closed book and not allowed people near the sites. There's all sorts of places there. Um, they've kept it closed up until this year, or th at least uh, several months ago. So why did they keep it closed? I don't know, but they allowed uh, Andrew in and his team to film, and, uh, and I think what he's finding is very interesting, and it does make you think. So here's some of the points I've written down, okay? Yeah. Well, um, Moses spent, remember, Moses spent 40 years in voluntary exile in Midian after killing the Egyptian. Do you remember he was brought up, you know, in the household of Pharaoh yep. uh, because of his mother putting him out amongst the reeds in a little, what do you basket. call it? Basket. Moses' basket, as we call them today. Mm -hmm. So he was picked up and he was adopted uh, by the Pharaoh's daughter, mm -hmm. right? So at one stage when he was growing up, uh, as, as a young man, he was riding through the area where the Hebrew slaves were, and one of the Hebrew slaves had been treated really badly by a, a fellow Egyptian. And Moses could not help himself, but ended up sticking up for the Hebrew slave to the point where he the did Egyptian... did more than sticking up for him. Well, he lost his life, Absolutely. The, the Egyptian, yeah. okay? But Moses became a little bit of afraid that the Pharaoh would find this out. And so he fled uh, to um, what is now called Saudi Arabia, which at that time um, was 
uh, where Jethro was, and it was in Midian, okay? And uh, Jethro, as we all know the story, Jethro was the priest at that time in that area for his particular religion, okay? And he had daughters. And Moses eventually marries uh, one of them, Zipporah. And so he spends uh, this 40 years in voluntary exile in this area called Midian, okay? And if you remember, he also experienced the burning bush. And that was at um, the Mount Horeb, I think it was as well, which is where you would say that a very special mountain, which could, have, could be very easily be um, the Mount, Mount Sinai, okay. okay? And that's placed in Saudi Arabia today. Then you have, uh, let me read some of the other notes. Following the articles for me does not add up um, for one reason. If Mount Sinai is the Sinai Peninsula where St. Catherine's Monastery is, you'd never get the amount of people uh, that uh, is recorded in scripture in that area. Because they wouldn't fit. They wouldn't fit. Okay. 600,000 men, uh, apart from women and children. But if you, as you're seeing on the map, if you were to cross over there, and this point here is a big enough area to house 600,000 men and women and children. I sent a signal out to Pharaoh who was chasing them, thinking they're all over the place. Ah, we've got them. And he sent you know, quite a large army, loads of chariots, l a large army. If it was as some of the people who are trying to say, well, it's the Sinai Peninsula, uh, which is where St. Catherine's Monastery is, you would only get a few thousand there. And yeah. that's what some of the arguments from people are saying. It wasn't 600,000 people that actually uh, went uh, out of Egypt. It was only 15,000. But then if you do your sums, and there's that way of, of doing it, which is um, allowing you to, uh, if you like, project the amount of people that would be there after 400 years of exile. Okay, even if you only had a couple, and I was trying to do this last night with my friend Jason. <laughs> you were. And it, if it you- It was very only, complicated. It was complicated. And if you only had two couples, um, over a period of time of 400 years, you would end up with uh, at, at least 130,000 people. That's the minimum. That's only two couples. And yet, if you actually calculate that the people who went into bondage would have been from the 12 tribes of Israel. And we know, I've got a chart here, that the 12 tribes of Israel, if you look at that, Leslie, you'll see number 600,000, if they'd all gone into bondage, you want to have a look at that? You want to hold that chart because then you can digest it a little bit. I'm trying. Okay. So many, many thousands of people went into exile for the 400 years. So you multiply all of those. You wouldn't have 15,000 people, would you, mm -mm. coming out no. into the exodus? Mm -mm. You would have, as the Bible says, 600,000 men plus women and children. So you need a big area for them to uh, assemble. And also at Mount Sinai, you would see that underneath the area where Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia is huge. It is absolutely huge landmass. Whereas around St. Catherine's Monastery, it's not so big. So although no one knows, you're sounding as if you're quite convinced. Well, um, uh, this is why I want to be talked yeah. out of it. <laughs> no, <laughs> there is that's another fine. way. I'm, because, but I'm, I'm looking at all the notes, and, and I do understand that this man, author uh, of uh, "Where Is Mount Sinai," it, he was talking about it. Author was uh, Gordon Franz, M.A. And so he, there's huge amounts of notes here, which I uh, would take me all night just to read them. But I have read them all already. <laughs> And I would say that I'm, I disagree with his findings because you end up with just a few um, thousand 
people that were going through the exodus. Now, the other point... Leslie, well, hang on. Before the other point, let's say good evening to Doris from Wales, who hey, says... Doris. Hi, Howard and Leslie. I'm fascinated by this programme tonight. Well, thank, thank you God for, for that. <laughs> thank you for doing this. I don't yet have an opinion, but I might have one by the end of the show. God bless all at Revelation TV. Wow. Yeah. But there were one, one or two points. Uh, when people came to... Um, the promised land, there were already uh, a huge number of people and they, the spies that uh, the, um, what's the place? Jericho, okay? Mm -hmm. Jericho had already sent out spies and could see this huge army of Israelites coming uh, or they'd heard they were in the area and they were afraid. They wouldn't be afraid of 15,000 men. Okay. They would be afraid if 600. there was 600,000 mm -hmm. and then they walked around the walls, remember, and they all come tumbling down. Yeah. I'm not going to go into song, by the way. You know. But, yeah, so that's one point alone. Mm -hmm. You know, is, if there's another question come in, give me a chance to look uh, at my notes as well. No, I haven't. There isn't. No. No. Come on, guys and girls. <laughs> but, you know, this is a lot of work. But, yes, I will get there. And I wish I hadn't have been interrupted because there was an important point that I was going to raise. Let me see if I can get to some of the other notes. Um, okay. So, uh, Moses, let's see, uh, he would have been a young man. Uh, he was already spent time in Midian. He left to come back here into uh, the Pharaoh's court. He wasn't, uh, he was then told by God, to tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. It didn't go down very well, did it? Um, and so then many years later, Moses would have been at that time around about 80 years old, okay? And yet he would have been, because he was 40 years in Midian, mm -hmm. and he must have been probably 20, 30, 40, and he, another 40 years later, he's then back in Egypt at 80 years of age. And he led the Hebrews out of Egypt and as the Bible records that Jethro, this was another point, advised Moses on delegating his workload to others, uh, making decisions for the daily things. Because when they were in the wilderness and traveling around all of, the, you know, every which way, um, they had lots of daily things, chores and questions, and there were people falling out with each other. Ah, that's what I was going to remember. Oh, there okay, you go. sorry, thank you. And right in the middle of all this exile, okay, and wandering in the wilderness, Korah caused a little bit of trouble. He started to question Moses, if you like, leadership. Yep. How many people left Egypt, did the, the people say earlier? Only 15,000. Well, the record shows that when Korah rebelled, God said, set them aside, and he swallowed them up. And a plague followed. There was 24,000 people lost their lives in one day because of their rebellion against Moses. How could you lose 24,000 men if you only 15,000 went into the wilderness in the first place, right? Point? Good, good point? point? Very good. Okay, so bear that in mind as well. Um, yeah. Any, any emails? Okay. I do need some help. So Les says, hello, Howard and Leslie. Having watched some of Ron Wyatt's photographic evidence, they do seem to fit the biblical description of the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt to Mount Sinai. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, and some people have said, you know, okay, that some people haven't believed what Ron was finding. Yeah, he had a he, lot of negativity, didn't he? he? He had to deal with a lot yeah, of negativity. Yeah, he did. Yes, bless his heart. He, he said in that area that we saw uh, from the very big beach area in the Sinai Peninsula to the beach area in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. there were artifacts found that were um, belonging to chariot wheels, the ancient chariot wheels, also the pillars apparently that Solomon had put there in between uh, the beginning of this particular piece of land that's on your screen now and the walking across this narrow strip, which is quite shallow, um, it did mean that they were actually um, I don't know, finding these pillars called Solomon's Pillars. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing is that what we're trying to do is help to support what the Bible says 
but really to discover where Mount Sinai was. Okay, so that's uh, more notes there. Let me see, is there any, any questions? So Cram on? says, hi, Howard and Leslie. I've honestly never ever thought about this subject, but it is totally mind blowing. And I'm with you there. I never, never thought about it uh, at all. And, uh, but it is, it yeah. is interesting because uh, I just, uh, I mean, listening to what you're saying, I certainly tend to agree, but I haven't heard anybody strongly talk about um, the other location right. being the one. Well, I'm, I'm going to use this program as a basis for doing another program in the sense I will edit bits and pieces tonight, put more uh, footage to it and put more uh, charts and things because I can't possibly put them all together on a small team that we've got in preparation for tonight's show. But I do want to go deeper and I'm as, I, I was motivated and moved to try and do something even though I might be going about it half cocked um, as they say. But um, I just want to actually read a few notes here because it said Mid, uh, Moses fled to Midian which was in northwest Saudi Arabia. He used the main trade route to get there, which was the most natural path between the two regions. And when Pharaoh heard about it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled to, uh, from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, which is what we were talking about earlier. That's in Exodus chapter two. Moses sees the burning bush um, and all of that. And he has that experience with the Lord. And then he goes, um, after looking after the flock uh, and, uh, of uh, Jethro, because he marries the daughter, etc., etc., um, and he gets used to that. Now, there's a little bit of confusion about when Jethro meets, it's in Exodus, I think, 18 or something like that, but it talks about it in Exodus, that he actually, um, well, doesn't say he went into the Sinai Peninsula to actually meet Moses because where would he know where he was? He didn't send him, you know, a WhatsApp with, a, a, <laughs> you know, what if it, what's it called, a pin drop. Exactly. So he didn't have Google Maps. Hmm. Where are you today, Moses? Well, I tell you, I think I'm between the mountain of and then, and uh, I'll see you there. Okay, I'll just pop over and see you from Saudi or Arabia, and I'll be in the peninsula probably in about five days. All right, mate, see you soon. No, he didn't say that. How could he go and find him? The, the Israelites themselves couldn't even know where they were mm. because the Lord was delivering them. He was punishing them. But at the same time, it's quite interesting, it put into the heart of Pharaoh that we've got these Israelites. We've got these Hebrews. We're going to slay them and they'll be wiped out forever. And God was playing a trick on, their, on Pharaoh by leading them up the garden path, as we might say, in and around. So he was, he was having fun with both the, both the Hebrews and the Egyptians. But at the end, he brought them to that piece of land, which has this huge beach. And uh, of course, they all tried to follow. Even though the water is quite shallow there, it's still, you know, probably, ooh, I don't know, 10 metres maybe, or even that's, eight metres. That's pretty deep. Yeah, but it was the shallow part as, as you'll see, mm. of, the, of the Red Sea, which yeah. coming up here on your screen again. He'd led them up there, then he brings them back south again. This is the Lord leading them to this beach area because the beach area there was so huge. And then across the water directly is this narrow part of where the Red Sea is built up, if you like, to be quite shallow. And uh, then it gets across to the other side and uh, you find a big landing area in what is now called Saudi Arabia. So, um, any, any questions coming in? Okay, so we've got one uh, from Dino. It says, I love the fact that you're doing this show tonight. Find the history of the Bible fascinating, and it would be wonderful to see more shows on this. I've been to St. Catherine's Monastery, and it was and is a beautiful location where you can really feel the presence of God. But as to if this is the historical location, I think it's highly unlikely. 
Many places supposedly biblical have no factual basis and were chosen through the choice of men. I tend to agree with Howard that a much wider area would have been needed for so many people. Brilliant show and look forward to more like this. Thank you. Blessings to all from Dino. Thank you, Dino. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to describe something because I'll, I'll probably end up putting some footage over it. But just imagine, OK, here on this side, of course, the, I'm looking at the television, so it'll be swapped. But on the side where the Sinai Peninsula is, it's the first piece of land when you come across uh, from where the Hebrews were in Goshen, which was right near the, if you like, northern part of Egypt. And you cross there where the reeds were. I mean, it's a, it's a very easy part just to walk across, okay? And that's why some, uh, if you like, uh, opponents to the Bible actually say, oh, it wasn't a really a big deal, you know, because they yeah. just walked across, so it was only a couple of feet deep. Well, then how come the Egyptians got swallowed up? If exactly. Was... Well, there's lots more to it. Very, but very good point, Les. So anyway, they get across there into the, uh, if you like, the more Western northwestern part of the Sinai Peninsula, and they start walking around. God led them through. And, he, and be, he, you know, really, if you think about it, the journey should have only taken probably a week or two weeks. <laughs> and it was 40 years wandering in the wilderness. That was their punishment for being a, a, a miserable bunch of people, really, basically, and, and obstinate, I think. Stiff-necked, I think, <laughs> um, is what the Bible uh, expresses uh, how God thought about the Hebrews at that time. So anyway, when you think they were wandering around and if they were going to go straight north, now we've all been to Alat, if you go straight north and up by to the Dead Sea, if you are on your right hand side is where the Moabites were, you know, where Ruth and, uh, all, for, and all those people were, right? So if you imagine that, um, and the, to the left is more like the Negev Desert, okay? And then a little bit further north, you've got Jericho. God shows Moses the promised land. And he said, but sorry, mate, you're not going in, okay? Okay, so then the people uh, of Israel, which was coming across and looking out from the big area at Jordan to look across the valley to where... Uh, the promised land was, and that was near Jericho. Right. Okay. Now, when you consider that if they'd gone into Saudi Arabia, is what we call it today, there's lots of things in Saudi Arabia that actually show you that they've got the well of Moses, they've got a cave of Elijah, they've got the split rock, which is huge, uh, where Moses got a bit cross and hit the rock and the water came pouring out because he was getting cross with these people, but God got <laughs> cross with him as well. So um, it was uh, not, a, not a very nice day for everyone. <laughs> so anyway, thinking about where they are in Saudi Arabia, which was called Midian, they went due north, which you would do. He didn't start crossing over to Elat. They went due north in what is now Jordan, and they got to Moab and they looked across uh, at a particular point, which is probably a little bit further north uh, where the Moabites were. And they were then going to cross into the promised land. That made sense. That's what I'm trying to say. Going due north from what is Saudi Arabia um, and then crossed over into the promised land. Instead of all this stuff around the Sinai, which they had to do partly. So, but if... Um, as Mount Sinai itself is in uh, Saudi Arabia, then it makes sense because there's all these other things which, as I say, the Saudi Arabians have been keeping quiet about. And yeah. uh, um, it's really good that you can now, uh, through Andrew Jones, uh, do tours as well to go and see those places. So I thought I'd just mention that. Okay, so Jane says, Hi, Howard and Leslie. Thank you for showing programmes about Ron Wyatt. I've been avidly interested in this since you first showed it. I'm very grateful for all your help. God bless and protect you both and all the Revelation TV and family. <clears throat> and June says, um, Helena, 
the mother of the Emperor Constantine mm -hmm. was the person who decided where Sinai was. Ah. Being the Emperor's mother, I doubt many would have disagreed with her. Thus, we have the wrong place unless we agree with Paul. Yeah, otherwise it is... <laughs> you lose your head. No, that's interesting, I didn't yeah. know that. So that, that, that's it, yeah. So you, it mm. would carry a lot of weight, uh, her, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Her opinions. <clears throat> And Annie says, Hi, Howard and Leslie. The Bible study team mentioned water depth. The Red Sea crossing needed a miracle, but the other body of water would have been shallow enough for the Egyptian army to cross and kill and capture the escaping Hebrews. They concluded the Red Sea crossing but likely... There, look, sorry, darling, yeah. but that is still deep enough to drown in. Okay. Yeah. Even though that's shallow, it's probably at least what, eight meters, ten meters. It's still big enough an area to actually cause, um, if you like, a traffic jam uh, of chariots. Uh, they concluded that the Red Sea crossing likely led to um, two million, two million. Sinai in current Saudi Arabia. Very interesting program, as is the study in Galatians. Thank you for all you and your small team do, says Annie. Thanks very much, Annie. And Pam in the East Midlands says, I've watched a few of these documentaries on finding the real pathway that would take about a million people and their animals. These happened centuries ago, so I wonder if earthquakes and land changes have caused many areas to disappear. I lean towards a very, very wide area for their moving around. Thanks for a deep study. We are thinking. Yeah. Okay. Annie, right? Is that Annie? No, that was Pamela. That oh, Pamela. One. That's a yep. very good point because I was thinking the very same thing today. And yep. that was, if, uh, as it is, a very volatile area for earthquakes and has been over the millennia, <coughs> in, and you would see that it's called the Rift Valley. Mm. All the way down that part, through the Dead Sea, through the Jordan Valley, um, all the way to the, the Sinai, you will see that there's been tremendous movements uh, of earthquakes and things like that. Um, but nevertheless, um, it is a good point, but how much has moved, uh, we don't know. We don't know. But certainly for sure, it is a volatile area and it is something to be taken into account. Okay, let's say hi to Ken in Ayrshire, Scotland. Hi, Howard and Leslie. I'm really enjoying this fascinating show. Thanks for taking the time to prepare in such detail. I remember how I did a program last December or January on the same subject and using some of the same footage with Pastor Hugh. That program stirred my curiosity on the subject, mm. and this is a great follow-up. I would encourage you, Howard, to carry on your studies and bring us more of the same. God bless all at Revelation oh. TV. Oh. Well, do you know, uh, the thing is, though, I'm just, I'm a bit of a waffler, and, and I'm, I'm not good at doing this, but I'm so, I don't care, I'll humiliate myself, because the thing is that it's, for me, it's so important to dig a little bit deeper into the Word of God only just to show people that it can be reliable. Even though people don't know where this or that place is, there's a lot of guesswork in all of it. But what, what the Bible says, when it says 600,000 men went into exile, uh, came out of exile, I should say at that time, yeah. uh, uh, and of the Exodus, then it means that. It didn't mean 15,000, mm -hmm. you know? As mm -hmm. I say, Korah lost, uh, uh, out of 24,000 24, yeah. in one day, yeah. you know, so, and then we know that with the, the multiplication of the birth rate and the death rate even taken into account uh, yeah. of just two couples producing over 400 years, something like uh, nearly 200,000 people, yeah. you know, so, and, and if you times that by, oh, well, you know, at least... I think there were 60,000 or 600,000 in that chart yeah. of the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. right? Just read some of the numbers to help the people understand that, darling. Okay, so Reuben, 46,500. Yeah. Sounds like is it in politics or something. Yeah. Simeon, 59,300. Gad, 45,650. Judah, 
74,600. Which is the largest of all of them, isn't it? Yeah, and so it, go, and so it yeah. goes. I mean, but it ends up with a total up. of... 603,500. And, and it would have been their descendants that would have gone into exile. Yeah. I, I, if I get my, um, remember my history a little bit. Okay, so Les says, Howard, it seems that Mount Sinai was not in Egypt, Exodus 19, 1. But if it was in Midian, why did Moses' Midianite in-laws leave Mount Sinai to return to their own land? Very good point. I read that scripture um, tonight and it is a fascinating thing. So where were they? It is a good point because it, ma it makes you think they were somewhere else. But how did Jethro and his uh, little family get to go to meet Moses? Where would he have met them? And how would he have known where to meet them if he was, say, in the Sinai Peninsula? Yeah. Was it somewhere else then? Was it? Or did he, ah, how about this? Okay, it just came to me. So if, if the the people of Israel had crossed over into Midian, which is the Saudi Arabia today, meets Jethro, and they travel. They travel north. They probably go, he might have gone as far as Moab okay. with, him, with, the, with the people of Israel, because he was helping him to come up with these wise men who could be, if you like, um, help PAs. PAs as well. Yeah. And, oh, Excuse me, also judges in that sense to settle yeah. disputes. Mm. And then he said, well, look, yeah, I've, I've gone far enough. I'm not going any further north. I'm going back to my land. So maybe that was it. But it is a, it's great that you got that scripture because I got it tonight before I went live. OK, Sue says, hello. Not, um, not only people were journeying, but also animals too, sheep, etc. Yeah. It's a very interesting, interesting poet quote program says sue i love the history of israel okay that's yeah. good john says good to see you both appreciate the fascinating background to israelites in the wilderness thank you graham says i read the pharaoh at the time of exodus and moses was that um, that moses and his wife queen hapshistut good luck <laughs> it was claimed that they both had boils, which was one of the curses. The Bible doesn't name the Pharaoh, but I find it very interesting. Um, actually, that's from Martin. Yeah. Mm. Um, again, I know it's somewhere in my notes, I was reading about the, mm. when um, Moses went back after being 40 years in Midian, um, when he escaped, you know, in case his life was going to be taken. And when he did go back, of course, he went back uh, with the message, look, you've got to say to the Pharaoh, let my people go. So he was emboldened enough to be able to do that. But it was a different Pharaoh by then. Okay. You know, the, the one who was, had helped him to actually um, to grow up with mm -hmm. in that court, the yeah. Pharaoh's court, would have passed one. away yeah. by then, yeah. Alex in Scotland says, great program, so interesting, bringing the Bible alive. Thank you, Howard and Leslie. I didn't do any <laughs> research whatsoever. I just said to Howard, I'll come and read the emails because I thought he had so many papers full of notes that there's no way he'd cope with the emails as well. So I don't take any credit whatsoever. Maggie says, can you relay to us any evidence to support the traditional Sinai place? I've always supported Ron Wyatt's and later Andrew Jones' belief in the Saudi Arabia location for the Holy Mountain, but I'm sure you'll want to be even-handed. This is what we were saying at the beginning no, of the right. programme. Uh, good Oops. point. Okay, well, shall I try and answer some of that from yeah, the let, notes that I've been Yeah, reading. let me Go just, on. Um, yeah. one more question from um, the same person. Also, how long would it have taken for the Hebrews Hebrew slaves plus herds of animals to get to the crossing into the south in the Saudi Arabia location. Okay, how long would it take? And let's start with the last bit because I can't remember the first bit now. Okay. So let's start with the last bit. How long would it take for the herds to cross the for the Hebrew the slaves plus the herds of animals to get to the crossing? Or to get to the crossing. Um, to go into a the good Saudi point. Arabia. Well, as you can see here, the Lord led them north of where that is and then came further south to this particular place as a name for it 
and I can't remember the name, but that's where uh, he led and led them. It doesn't say, or I haven't come across it, if somebody else knows how long it took before they got to that particular part. Well, it couldn't have been too long. The reason is that the Pharaoh and his um, army were chasing after the Israelites or the Hebrews, whatever you want to call them. Um, and they, if he were chasing them, he wouldn't have been chasing them for months and months or years. He yeah. would have run out of steam and say, oh, forget mm. it for a game of soldiers, mate. OK, so he would have probably, it might have only taken them weeks or month, a month or two um, before they crossed uh, over. Because it was something which um, was, it, it, it was some sort of, uh, anger that Pharaoh had. He was sitting back. He said, I've let them all go. And well, I'm, now I'm regretting it. He changed so in mind. the heat of the moment, he gets his army and he starts to chase them. If it went on for a long time, I think he would have lost. He said, this is ridiculous. Calm down. Calm down, Pharaoh. <laughs> Hi, Howard and Leslie. I watched a program which I thought was on Revelation TV. It was by an American team who used drones to prove that the Exodus travelled via the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia and Mount Sinai. The Saudi government had this important site fenced off, yes, but yes. they had special access. That's it. Other important sites also seen, an oasis, coral for sheep and cattle, uh, the foot of Mount Sinai, cleft rock, etc. Yes, yeah. Well, I'm going to be showing that when I add this to, uh, when I add all the, that video to this particular program. So by the time it gets repeated, I'm hoping I've got all that edited and it'll be a standalone program for future reference. I don't know whether I answered the first part of that other lady's question, because I, by the time you'd gone to the second question, I'd forgotten what the first question was, but I think it was important enough. To, to make sure well, that she, she was just saying, can you relay to us any evidence to supporting the traditional Sinai place? Right. And she says, I've always supported Ron Wyatt yeah. and Andrew Jones. But, uh, I, I, I just don't think there's enough landmass around the base of the traditional St. Catherine's uh, monastery site uh, yeah. for um, that being Mount Sinai, because as I say, yes, you might only get 14 or 15,000 people around it, which is why some of the people have tried to argue that the Bible was wrong in naming a number of 600,000. Whereas the other one, which is in Saudi Arabia, it's got huge areas, which I'll be able to show you uh, when I actually edit this program. I'll show you the landmass, which is uh, just at this, the head uh, or, or just at the mount or the base of the Mount Sinai itself. OK, Mike says, we were told the reason it took the Israelites 40 years to traverse to the Promised Land was God's plan to shed or lose the older folk en route and have only the younger folks who had been taught the Jewish law during that period as nomads to enter the Promised Land. Because the older folk had adopted the Egyptian ways of worshipping false god and also homosexuality was rife, um, and in the minds of the older folk, says Mike. Yeah. I think is when you think of the likes of Joshua, um, who was the next generation that were coming up, they would have been born probably in the wilderness. Yeah. Okay. And they were the ones that, uh, what was it, Caleb? Was it Joshua and Caleb? Yes. Um, and even Moses himself wasn't allowed in. No. Um, so, yeah, it was a fresh start. I always start. thought that was really sad. Ah, oh, but Moses is uh, is in the Lord's. I know, place. but it was just like all that work. Yeah, the Lord took him just like he I did know. with Elijah, because no, nowhere was his body going to be found because he didn't want to make a shrine to to Moses. And sure. uh, you know, very special man, very special. God wouldn't have uh, he wouldn't have enjoyed not letting him in. It's the fact he took him home. Yeah, for a better place. OK, Maggie says, please mention something about all the other sites mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> the bitter Sorry, I've got all, all year tonight. Hang on, <laughs> she's told you. The bitter sprigs, the many sites of animal sacrifices, etc. They were all on the Midian side. Right, OK. OK, okay mm. I didn't know that. I'll need to look at that. Yeah. But when you think of the things <coughs> that, um, that happened during that 40-year journey, 
Um, it was, uh, I mean, the commandments, first of all, the Ten Commandments came out of that. So he came down, didn't he, from Mount uh, Sinai. And he actually, the first time he threw them down because there was the golden calf uh, set up and they said, well, Moses going, why have you done that? Why have you done that? Well, you've been gone a long time. We need something to worship, <laughs> you know. Oh, my God. reminds us of, yeah. of us today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not and keeping our eyes on our eyes. That's right. Mm. So that's a good point as it ties in with well, the, the, other, the other caller, uh, a person that was writing in, uh, to say that, you know, a lot of things that the new generation would have taken in yeah. to that land. Yeah, it, it was a fascinating time. There was lots of lessons learned, but um, it just shows you. And I think, you know, maybe churches ourselves, we, we tend to get to be a moaning lot of willies, you know, moaning and because the people of Israel kept moaning, oh, we were better off in Egypt. We're you know, hungry, we've got nothing you know, to eat. We got nothing, we got this manna stuff that falls and down. And there's never any left over <coughs> for us. Oh, there is. Do you know one day of the week? Mm -hmm. Do you know which day it was? Coming up for the Shabbat. Before the sh yeah, exactly. Yeah. I need to take one of those pills. Mm. <coughs> oh, dear. <coughs> Live TV, there you Live go. Live TV, yeah. A strep so for you. So if you read a few thousand emails, I can just <laughs> get out of this one. Oh dear, I don't Thank know you. about a few thousand, but uh, Steve and I will read yours. Hi, Howard and Leslie. Uh-oh, I missed the start tonight. <coughs> it's so interesting to see <coughs> how these biblical sites are being revealed to us in these end days. Thank you, says Stephen. Okay, so, yeah, uh, you've only got about four minutes left. You've got lots and lots of notes there. So have you got some <coughs> more gems for us? You must have. Well, I can't even breathe. Why don't we show the intro video <coughs> uh, as much as we can? <laughs> yes, because <coughs> people might, would have missed the beginning of the program. Yeah. God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before pi Haharoth, between Migdal and the sea. Here there was enough space for the children of Israel to gather in order to cross the Red Sea. En route to this beach, Moses led the children of Israel through many winding and wandering pathways. In Exodus uh, chapter 14 verse 3, it says they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Josephus, the first century historian, wrote, they drove them into a narrow place. The Lord God of Israel led his people to the Red Sea, knowing that Pharaoh and his armies were thinking that they had hemmed in the children of Israel so they could slaughter them all. This account was reinforced again by Josephus, the historian. They were encompassed with mountains, the sea, and their enemies. With nowhere to escape, they were between the devil and the deep blue sea. However, right here is an area that was much shallower than the main part of the Red Sea. But nothing would be hard for God Almighty. As the scripture in Isaiah chapter 51 verse 10 says, Are you not the one that made the depths of the sea a road? And here across the waters, in what is now called Saudi Arabia, is a huge area which could easily cope with 600,000 men of Israel, let alone the children and the women. However, there is much more that I would like to share with you regarding the Exodus, so please stay tuned. Thank you. Well, I've got to say, um, we, uh, as I did before, we'll be adding more to this program to, to help it um, um, tell a lot more of, of what the accounts were, because there's a lot more information uh, that's impossible to go through tonight. But I've just got to say, that it, there had to be, um, I suppose, a lot more evidence to prove that the Sinai, uh, Mount Sinai in the peninsula, you know, Sinai Peninsula, St. Catharines, doesn't quite cut, cut it for me. I know some people, uh, many people will have been there. I did 
try to uh, go up that particular mountain, there was a snake on the way, so I turned Ooh. back. But it wasn't only that, it was so hot and it was so high, because I think it's some, some 7,000 feet high, you know, so it is quite a lot, a uh, long way to go up. Any, any particular? So Doreen, say, yeah, I've just, uh, Doreen says, Exodus 3, verse 12, God said to Moses, when you have brought out the people from Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. And she says, this, mount, this was in Midian. Um, what she says and then uh, did you know that Joshua's friend Caleb Caleb was a Gentile I've often wondered about the significance of this I'm sure this is important for Jews and Gentiles wow okay. and if you think about it um, Ruth uh, was a Moabiter yeah and she is in the lineage of the line that produces Jesus you know? so, right. so it shows that the Gentiles will come in as well in these last days and there are promises there in Romans chapter 10 and 11 which are fascinating reading but we as Gentiles have to not be arrogant and puffed up and think that we've replaced uh, Israel because God said no never and uh, we need to be uh, humble and look to what God is going to be doing for both the Jew, Gentile, and all those other nations from the Arab nations that are gonna come in. Isaiah chapter 19. So you take care. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you all. Take care. God bless.